things like we're now open. <laughs> Excellent. So we'll give it just a moment for, I can see people signing in. Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. We'll just give it a few moments as people are signing in. So welcome to today's webinar on AL amyloidosis and treatment approaches. My name is Isabel Lusada. I'm the CEO and founder of the Amyloidosis Research Consortium, also known as ARC. ARC was founded in 2015 to um, accelerate the development of new treatments for patients with all types of amyloidosis, with a real focus on improving quality of life. We have four main areas of our focus. One is improving speed and accuracy of diagnosis. And I'm sure everybody here who's experienced AL amyloidosis will have had a journey to get there. We also work on increasing the understanding of the genetics and biology of the disease to better identify new treatments. We work very closely and collaboratively with all stakeholders to accelerate the regulatory approval of new treatments and also the effective reimbursement. Cost can be an issue. And lastly, we have programs and ARC taught schools into this to enhance the care and quality of life of patients and caregivers throughout their amyloidosis journey. I'm very grateful to our sponsors who would like to recognize here today who are supporting the ARC talks programs. So without further ado, I would love to introduce you to Dr. Sasha Tuckman, who has research focuses on amyloidosis and myeloma. He participates in clinical trials, and he's really built a very impressive, comprehensive, multidisciplinary amyloidosis program at UNC. I'm really excited as an AL patient myself to um, see the change and growth of different treatments in AL amyloidosis, as well as the um, really promising future. So without further ado, Dr. Tuckman, let me hand over to you. Great, thank you very much. And huge thanks to Isabel and to ARC, all the great people at ARC for hosting this webinar and inviting me to give it. I'm very happy to be here and to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is AL amyloid. Let me just try to share slides. Can we see the slides okay? Yep, there's a perfect, and I would just add, we'll have a question and answer session at the end. So please type your questions in whenever you have them in the box and we will have a moderated session at the end. Sounds good. And so we're gonna talk about AL amyloidosis and this is sort of a general update. And so in terms of disclosures, so I do a lot of research, I've done some work for individual companies. Um, I'd say the relevant um, conflicts of interest disclosures would be for Kalem. So we'll talk about the KL-101 study, which is a, not an FDA approved drug. Diratumumab, of course, makes news in amyloid. And then we'll talk about Venetoclax also. So I have um, done research study, done research um, and other work for those companies. So in terms of the outlines, so in discussing what we should, when discussing what we should cover today, um, so worked out this agenda with Isabel. So we'll do a brief introduction and reminder about amyloidosis in general, and then specifically AL. Um, we'll talk about really what's been one of the most pivotal and important studies in amyloidosis in many years, which is the Andromeda study. Um, we'll talk about venetoclax and specifically this, this chromosomal abnormality that we see called T1114. We'll talk about amyloid degrader medications, a very exciting, relatively new drug class that we're testing in amyloidosis. And then Isabel also wanted me to mention just briefly our amyloid, amyloidosis clinic at UNC. So I'll talk about that too. So again, very brief reminder about amyloidosis. I'm sure you're all relative experts in this, but for those who are relatively new to this, amyloidosis we know is a protein disorder. Um, so we all have proteins in the body. We eat proteins, our body uses proteins to build skin, muscle, different tissues. 
Uh, but amyloidosis is an example of what happens in the body when proteins go bad. So amyloidosis is basically the deposition of abnormal proteins in different tissues. And that causes those organs not to work quite right. So here we see an example of a heart. So on the top left, that's basically the heart of somebody who passed away from amyloidosis. It's basically the heart is sort of cut in half. And on the right part, you can see that's a part of the heart called the right ventricle. And then on the left part, you see that, that that's the left ventricle. And you don't have to be a pathologist or a cardiologist to look at that and say that that doesn't look quite right. So all the kind of reddish stuff on the outside is muscle. And then the black space in the middle is where is the chamber where blood goes. And so it's not hard to imagine that when the walls of the heart are that thick, because that's where the amyloid deposits itself, and the chamber becomes smaller and smaller, and there's not enough space in there for blood to fill, and therefore patients develop problems with heart, heart function um, as part of their amyloidosis. And then on the right part, we see what's called electron microscopy, which is just a way of looking at something in incredibly high magnification. And basically what you see is the H. So right in the middle, those are normal heart fibers. So those are the individual heart muscle fibers. And then that A part on the top left is sort of that kind of cottony or cotton candy appearing material. And that's basically the amyloid, amyloid protein that has deposited itself between the heart muscle fibers. So you see this and it's not hard to imagine that when people have enough of that, then the walls of the heart get thick and the actual muscle fibers of the heart can't squeeze or contract as, as they normally should. Um, and that can happen in any number of different organs in the body and that can cause different patterns of organ dysfunction. So one critical distinction, as we all know, is that amyloid comes from different places. In the middle, you see kind of that circle with the greenish stuff that refers to what we call apple green birefringence. So those of you who have read a lot about amyloid have probably seen that term. That just refers to the fact that when we do biopsies looking for amyloidosis, the gold standard test to look for the amyloid in that tissue is called Congo red. And then you look through it, they, they look at that through a special microscope. And if it shows up green like that, then that's what we call apple green birefringence. And that's characteristic for amyloidosis. But what's key to that is to realize that amyloid protein, when we see it like that, can come from any number of different tissues. And sort of, so the blue ovals on the outside are just a partial example of what that, of the, the different sources of the amyloidosis. So we see on the top left, light chain amyloidosis or AL, that's from plasma cells. That's the, the focus of the discussion today. But then on the top right, we see ATTR amyloidosis. That can be wild type or mutant. So top right is mutant, bottom left is wild type different discussion for a different day. And then there are very many forms of amyloidosis that can come from different sources too. But the focus of the discussion today, again, is on the top left, which is light chain amyloidosis. And so we know that amyloid can affect almost any organ in the body except the brain. So we looked at a picture of a, of a heart that's been impacted or afflicted by amyloidosis a couple of slides ago. We know that amyloid can affect the GI tract, so that can deposit in basically the walls of the stomach and the intestine and the colon, um, that it can cause problems with absorption, where it interferes with food's ability to travel from the inside of the GI tract into the bloodstream. The nervous system is a common target for amyloidosis, so there's different parts of the nervous system. We often think of what's called the peripheral nervous system, and when that's impacted by amyloidosis, it can cause numbness and tingling, especially in the toes that works its way up and it can impact the fingers also. Uh, but then there's also autonomic neuropathy, which is basically damage to the nerves that control sort of internal processes such as blood pressure, heart rate, and also GI tract motility, meaning that the GI tract, when food is in there, it squeezes, it pushes food along as part of digestion and there's nerves that coordinate that process. So if those nerves are affected by amyloidosis, then people can have problems with the GI tract having trouble with normal contraction. And that can cause to things like nausea, vomiting, bowel irregularity. Um, carpal tunnel syndrome is on that list also. That's a unique phenomenon to amyloidosis and it's sort of a form of neuropathy, but it's a little bit different in the sense that that's basically something that impacts the nerves that go to the fingers, that go to the hands on both sides and the fingers. And basically there's a tunnel in the wrist called the carpal tunnel that the nerves travel through and that tunnel can develop amyloidosis deposition in it that then presses on the nerve and causes nerve dysfunction. So in that the nerve itself is actually fine, but it's being compressed by that amyloidosis on the outside. Um, and then on the right, you see some other examples. So deposition in the relatively thin skin around the eye can cause that bruising or what we call periorbital purpura. Uh, 
Macroglossia is amyloid deposition in the tongue, where it can cause the tongue to swell and grow and cause trouble with chewing and swallowing and speaking. And then it can also deposit in the kidney and the liver and cause different forms of injury there. Um, and this is a partial list, as said, this is not comprehensive and, and truly amyloidosis can deposit in virtually any organ except the brain. Um, and so when we think about where light chain amyloidosis comes from, it really comes from abnormal plasma cells. So again, keep in mind, this is different from other forms of amyloidosis, such as TTR, which has nothing to do with plasma cells. Um, but in light chain amyloidosis, we have plasma cells in the bone marrow, and these are usually what we call clonal, or you'll sometimes you'll see the term monoclonal, which means the same thing. Clonal and monoclonal are interchangeable terms. And so what that means is that you have typically one cell, so one normal plasma cell in the bone marrow that's normal, it's doing its job, which is to help to produce proteins that protect us against infection. And that cell, like all other cells in the body, has to replicate itself. So our cells are, in most cases, constantly dividing to keep themselves fresh. And because, you know, we hopefully live 80 or 90 years and an individual cell can't live for that long, so it has to replicate or reproduce itself. So every time a cell reproduces itself, it has to copy over its entire genetic structure, so all of its chromosomes, and it commonly makes errors. So when that happens, most often the cell can repair the errors, or if it can't do that, usually it has sort of a self-destruct mechanism that causes the cell to die, but occasionally things slip through. And when those errors slip through, then it means the daughter cells from that one original one have this new genetic abnormality. And so sometimes those abnormalities can cause those cells to grow more. So it's almost like hitting the gas pedal in the car. And they can also cause the cells to not die when they're supposed to. So most cells in the body kind of know when it's their time to grow. They know when it's their time to die. It sounds like that should be a song. But they know when it's time to grow. They know when it's time to die. And so cells, when they've had these genetic abnormalities, they lose those normal regulatory mechanisms. And so as that happens, in this case, in a plasma cell, that one plasma cell divides, it becomes two, later on those divide, they become four, four becomes eight, and then further down the road, you have billions of plasma cells. And what's important is that under those circumstances, whatever protein that original cell was pr producing, so that light chain protein, typically in this case, which is an immune protein, that one cell, when it becomes billions, all of those cells are making the same protein. And if it happens to be a protein that's structured in a way that can form amyloidosis, then you hit sort of a critical level of that protein in the blood, and then that protein starts depositing in different tissues and forming amyloidosis. So that gets us to this slide, which is basically abnormal cells in the top. So you see those cells, it's what, which is what they look like under the microscope. Those cells make what we call amyloidogenic light chain, which circulates in the blood. Amyloidogenic just means that that, that light chain can make amyloidosis. And then, and then the, that, that light chain protein deposits in the different tissues and can eventually cause organ um, dysfunction. And so this is kind of what this looks like. It's a little bit more scientific than we probably want to get into, but this just gives you a sense for how this happens. Where on the bottom left, you can see that's the light chain protein, and it's usually kind of folded up like that. In that phase, it cannot form amyloidosis because it's not in the right conformation or shape. In the middle, you see what they refer to as nucleation. So nucleation means that a couple of these proteins have unfolded. They've begun sticking together to form that amyloid protein, but there's not much of it yet. But then importantly, once you have a little bit of this, then that kind of clump of protein can serve as a focus for more protein to deposit. And as that happens, it sort of starts this critical process where once you have enough of this protein, more sticks, and then the process accelerates itself to the, to the degree that eventually um, you have enough of that amyloid protein in there that it causes the organs not to work right. And that's when people can develop actual symptoms related to this coming from dysfunction of the organs that are impacted by this. And so when we think about how we treat amyloidosis, <clears throat> historically, it's really been all about killing the cells. So we said that the cells are the source of this quote unquote amyloidogenic light chain. And so all the treatments in amyloidosis have typically focused on killing off as many of those cells as possible. And this is where the link to multiple myeloma comes in, which we often talk about. Multiple myeloma is more common than amyloidosis. Multiple myeloma is a real form of cancer that comes from plasma cells. And a lot of drugs have been developed for multiple myeloma. Um, and that's all relevant to amyloidosis because both myeloma and amyloidosis or light chain amyloidosis, I should say, are problems with plasma cells. So the same cells, they're just doing different things in the body to form either multiple myeloma versus amyloidosis. 
And so what ends up happening is that drugs get developed in multiple myeloma and we borrow them for, for amyloidosis because ultimately we're just trying to kill plasma cells. So it makes sense that myeloma drugs work in amyloidosis. And so until now, pretty much all the treatments that we've had for light chain amyloidosis really, again, are focused on killing those bad plasma cells. So that can be chemotherapy, if that's dexamethasone, if it's cyclophosphamide, if it's bortezomib, if it's stem cell transplant, so even that high-dose melphalan drug, those are all just medicines that go in and kill off as many of those bad cells as possible. And as we kill off those bad cells, and they, of course, stop producing as much of that abnormal light chain protein, so the light chain protein in the blood drops, and that means that there's less available or less protein available to actually further deposit in the tissues and cause further organ dysfunction. And so what can happen after that, after that protein has been adequately suppressed, is that the organs can actually start to heal. And that's when we see organ recovery. And what's sort of the new kid on the block with this is that there's new drug classes that are trying to not quite bypass killing plasma cells, but attack a different aspect of this disorder, which is the protein itself. So as mentioned, some amyloid treatments until now are really indirectly effective in, in fixing organ dysfunction related to this. We kill plasma cells, light chain level drops, and then we kind of keep our fingers crossed and hope that organs heal up. Uh, as that amyloid protein that's already stuck in, let's say the heart and kidneys becomes dissolved, it breaks up, and then the organs actually run better. But what's come out more recently is that there have been a couple of medications that have been looked at, which actually go to the different organs, we think, and help to break down the amyloid that's there already. So for a long time, we've used the antibiotic doxycycline. We're not really going to talk about that today. I would just say that it's somewhat controversial as to how well that works. EGCG is green tea extract. That's another one that's often talked about. And we use some of it, but that's a little bit more controversial too. Uh, but more exciting is the development of drugs called monoclonal antibodies, which are a specific type of drug. Uh, but basically what these are being looked at for um, is that they're being looked at as drugs that, again, go into the different organs, stick to the amyloid protein that's there already, and basically help our immune system to break it down. So you can think of it as sort of a way of directly clearing out the amyloid protein that's in those different organs, which is critical because, you know, sometimes we do use successful chemotherapy, we suppress the light chain proteins, but the organs don't necessarily get a whole lot better because the damage has already been done. So drugs like this will hopefully help to break down the amyloid that's there already, and that should help to facilitate organ healing. So now to move on to the actual, to sort of the meat of the talk. So we'll talk about this study called Andromeda, looking at the combination of diratumumab plus chemotherapy called Cybor-D. And so that's a picture of the Andromeda galaxy. I think it's beautiful. Um, and so essentially where this came from um, is the drug diratumumab, where we've, we've used this chemotherapy combination called Cybor-D, which we'll talk about, I think, on the next slide, in amyloidosis for a long time. But diratumumab is the relative new kid on the block. Um, and diratumumab is a drug that's been around and approved for multiple myeloma for many years now, and we've been borrowing it for AL amyloidosis, but it's not approved, or it, until now it has not been approved. It's what's called a CD38 unconjugated monoclonal antibody. So the exact mechanisms of how these drugs work isn't critical, but basically this is a protein that we give typically subcutaneous, subcutaneously now, so as a shot under the skin. The medicine goes into the blood, it goes to the bone marrow, it sticks to the surface of, moly, of, of um, amyloidosis cells in the bone marrow, um, and then it causes those cells to die. Um, and this came from some initial pilot studies in light chain amyloidosis showing that the drug um, seemed to be tolerable and fairly efficacious, meaning that it worked to suppress amyloidosis. And so the study looked at, this is a study looking at, again, Cyborg D chemotherapy, which is, you know, we have these crazy, these crazy abbreviations in hematology oncology. Cyborg D refers to cyclophosphamide, so that's the cy part. The bor comes from bortezomib, which is known by the brand name of Velcade, and the, the D is dexamethasone. So Cyborg D is just a combination of cyclophosphamide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone. And so this was a study looking at adding diratumumab to standard Cybor-D in newly diagnosed amyloidosis in patients who had it in the heart. And basically, they were, patients were randomized one-to-one. -one, so everybody got the Cybor-D chemotherapy, and there was a one-to-one -one randomization. So basically, a coin flip by which half of patients had diratumumab added to their treatment and half of patients did not. Um, and the diratumumab was for two, two years. Um, importantly, the study excluded certain patients. So again, patients were required to have involvement of the heart or cardiac involvement. 
Um, but as you can see in the bullet points below, so it excluded patients with severe heart failure. So they had to have some degree of heart failure, but it couldn't be too severe. Patients with severely reduced kidney function were also excluded from the study. So we refer to that as a GFR, which is just a measurement of kidney function. Um, and then beyond that, we also had to be able to fairly easily see the amyloidosis protein in the blood. So it's basically that light chain protein, or there's this other test called M spike, which we can look at. And those are basically just measurements of the amyloidosis protein in the blood. And because a major endpoint of the study was to see how much the addition of daratumumab suppresses those bad amyloid proteins, the study required that patients had measurable proteins in the blood before they went on the study, or you'd have nothing to measure. Um, and so what we'll look at here is um, basically the, the, the study itself. And again, with the, at risk of getting a little bit too scientific, um, I'll go through, go through some of the endpoints of the study. So the primary endpoint of the study was what we call hematological complete response. So response or hematological response in, in blood disorders or plasma cell disorders, such as multiple myeloma or amyloidosis, refers to suppression of the bad protein that's in the blood. So we know, again, cells in the bone marrow, we have the protein in the blood and amyloidosis. That protein is what, again, causes organ dysfunction. So it makes sense that it's important to suppress that bad protein. So when we talk about hematological responses, that's what we're talking about, suppression of that bad protein. And there's different grades of response, as you likely know, and one of the grades is a complete response, which means that we've suppressed the bad protein and we've actually done a bone marrow biopsy to see, to see how many abnormal cells are in there. And they're both suppressed below detectable levels for the most part. So we call that a complete response. And so what you see on the left is what percentage of patients in each category achieved responses in general, as well as specifically a complete response. So you see on the left, the DARA Cyborg D refers to patients who got Cyborg D plus the daratumumab drug. And then on the right, you could see patients who just got Cyborg D. And again, we don't need to run through this in exhaustive detail, but you see that the, the entire bars there refer to the overall response. So that's patients that had more than a 50% drop in their light chain or M-spike protein. So 92% of patients achieved that when they got the daratumumab versus 77% of patients that achieved that with just Cyborg D. But then as far as the exact endpoint of the study, you can see the red circles refer to the fact that 53% of patients who got daratumumab plus Cyborg D achieved a complete response versus 18% of patients who got Cyborg D. So basically that tells us that the addition of daratumumab did a much more, a much more effective job of suppressing that bad amyloidosis protein in the blood. Um, importantly, responses were also faster. So time is amyl or time is survival in this disorder. And so it's important to suppress those bad proteins as quickly as possible. And so median time to best response, meaning the, the average time that it took to get the protein down maximally in each individual patients was 60 days for patients who got the daratumumab versus 90 days for Cyborg D. And then they did what's called subgroup analysis, which is when you look at specific groups of patients within this larger study. And what they found, um, to summarize it really briefly, is that the benefit was present irrespective of baseline variables. So regardless of whether kidney function was a little bit better or worse, regardless of whether the heart failure was more severe or less severe, regardless of other factors, the addition of daratumumab seemed to benefit everyone. And that's important because sometimes in other studies, different interventions can benefit different subgroups differently. And we'll actually, we'll look at that with, with venetoclax in a little while. Um, and so this is looking at longer term endpoints for this study. And so this is again, a little bit technical, but what this is getting at is what's called a modified PFS. And modified PFS is basically, it's a, it's a clinical trial endpoint looking at time from initiation of therapy until, um, until basically progression of amyloidosis, meaning light chains have come down and they're now coming back up. We call that progression or relapse, or the development of end-stage cardiac disease or renal disease. So patients who needed something like a heart transplant or they went on dialysis or needed a kidney transplant or death. Um, and so this, this endpoint was looking at time from initiation of therapy until any of those things happened. That's what we refer to as modded, modified progression-free survival. And on the left, you can see what we call a survival curve. And basically the two lines refer to the different groups. The top line is daratumumab. The bottom line is what they call control, or that's the group that just got the Cyborg D. 
And basically as things happen, so as individual patients hit these events, meaning hematological progression or development of end-stage cardiac or renal disease, or they succumb to their amyloidosis, then the curve drops. So as the curve drops, it basically means more bad things are happening. And as you can see, the duratumumab line is above the control line or the cyborg D line by quite a bit. And that tells us that the duratumumab is delaying time to progression of those bad, delaying time to development of those bad things happening. Um, so this again was, a, was a very promising and showed that the addition of duratumumab helped to not only suppress that bad amyloid protein more than, than cyborg D alone, but it also helped to improve these longer term endpoints also, which are really critical. And so the next thing is to say, okay, so if the, if the duratumumab keeps, knocks the proteins down more and it keeps amyloidosis in remission, so under control or with suppressed proteins for a long period of time, does that translate into organ recovery? And then if we think about what we really care about in amyloidosis, it's basically the organs. We don't care about the proteins because no one feels their light chains in the blood. They could be 100, they could be 10, they could be 1,000. You don't feel high proteins. What you feel with amyloidosis is when the heart's not squeezing right, or when the kidneys are having different issues and causing problems there, or when the nerves are affected and they're not working quite right. So this was testing the idea that because daratumumab suppresses that bad light chain protein more, that it could in turn help those organs to recover more significantly and more quickly. And so what we saw was that that indeed was the case. So there are two graphs here. You can see on the left, cardiac response, or basically improvement in the heart, versus on the right, renal response, which is improvement in the kidneys. And what we saw was that the purple bars refer to the daratumumab group, the orange bars refer to the cyborg D group, and a higher percentage in both categories achieved the response. So 42% of patients achieved a cardiac response who got daratumumab versus 22% who got cyborg D. And then similarly for renal responses or kidney responses, 54% of patients who got daratumumab enjoyed a renal response versus just 27% of patients who got the cyborg D. So adding daratumumab helped the heart and the kidney to recover from amyloid damage. And so further data on the Andromeda study, basically, you know, we always think about safety. So, okay, the drug works better, but is it causing increased problems or side effects? Um, and not much. So daratumumab, as some of you have probably experienced, is typically a pretty easy drug to tolerate. And we didn't see any, we know what the safety profile is for that drug. We really didn't see any surprises on the Andromeda study, which is good. You know, you don't want undue surprises and, and or new bad side effects. And as a result of this Andromeda study, you know, the one thing happened for the first time in amyloidosis, which was incredibly exciting, which is that a drug was approved. So we all know that we've been borrowing drugs from myeloma for decades now for treating amyloidosis and Andromeda resulted in the first drug being approved specifically for light chain amyloidosis. And so subcutaneous daratumumab, so given as a shot under the skin instead of in the vein, is approved for use in combination with the cyborg D chemotherapy for newly diagnosed light chain amyloidosis by the FDA, so in the United States, by the European Medical Association um, in Canada, and in various other countries. So good news, a drug is finally approved in amyloidosis, and it's a good one. But I think that a lot of us who do amyloidosis are still sort of scratching our heads. You know, we're very excited about daratumumab. It's clearly a great drug from the perspective of helping to treat amyloidosis um, and to suppress those bad proteins. It's great in terms of side effects in the sense that it really doesn't add much, but there are still some outstanding questions. And so one big one is how does stem cell transplant fit in? So we know that for decades now, stem cell transplant using a person's own stem cells. We call that autologous stem cell transplant, or sometimes you'll hear peripheral blood transplant or bone marrow transplant. It's all basically the same thing. Uh, but the Andromeda study did not incorporate stem cell transplant. So if we think we have this great new regimen of daratumumab plus cyborg D for treating amyloidosis, does transplant still add anything? Does it no longer add anything because daratumumab cyborg D is so good? We really don't know. Um, and then the other question that evolved out of Andromeda is what do we do for patients who, for example, have advanced cardiac light chain amyloidosis? Because we said that to qualify for the Andromeda study, patients had to have some degree of cardiac dysfunction, but not too severe. So for patients who wouldn't have qualified for Andromeda because the heart failure was too severe, in theory, we don't really have data for those patients because Andromeda didn't study them. So these are outstanding questions in, uh, in amyloidosis 2022 that we still don't have answers to. And we can, of course, discuss these after in the Q&A if people have questions about it.
So moving on to T1114 and venetoclax. And so basically the idea behind this is that T1114 refers to a specific chromosomal abnormality that we can sometimes see in multiple myeloma or amyloidosis. And the T1114 is just sort of genetic nomenclature by which I mean that in every, every scientific field has its own language and genetics is no, exempt, no exception to that. So what T1114 refers to is that all of us have 23 chromosomes, so two, uh, two copies of 23 chromosomes, so 46 chromosomes in all the cells of our body in theory. And all those chromosomes have numbers. And so T1114 refers to what's called a translocation. So translocation means that pieces of chromosomes get switched. And this is usually as the chromosomes are copying themselves in cells. Again, this is one of the errors that can happen. So T1114 means that a piece of chromosome 11 gets switched with a piece of chromosome 14 so that they end up, they just end up flipped. So you have a piece of chromosome, chromosome 11 on chromosome 14, and you have a piece of chromosome 14 on chromosome 11. And so this does various things in the cell that activates this thing called cyclin D1, which in turn activates this thing called BCL2, which is really the key when we talk about this drug called venetoclax. And so what you can see on the left is that, that, that cell there with the BCL2, so the BCL2 is kind of that green Pac-Man thing. A pro-apoptotic protein is that little yellow wedge. And pro-apoptosis or a pro-apoptotic protein is basically a, a, it's just a protein in cells that helps them to die when they're supposed to. It's sort of like something that can turn on a self-destruct mechanism in a cell that needs to die. But when BCL2 is too high because of this T1114 translocation, then the BCL2 ties up all of that pro-apoptotic protein so the cell doesn't die even though it's supposed to. And that cell then, it happens in plasma cells. So that cell grows, it makes light chain protein, and then light chain forms the amyloidosis. And so then this drug called venetoclax is available. It's FDA approved, not for amyloidosis, but it's available for um, different other blood disorders such as acute leukemia and chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And so what venetoclax does is it basically takes the place of that pro-apoptotic protein in BCL2. So the venetoclax you see in the middle there, that kind of that blue diamond where the venetoclax drug sticks to that BCL2 molecule, there's now no space for that pro-apoptotic protein the pro-apoptotic protein is released, it goes into the cell and it basically causes things to happen that cause that cell to die. So that's how venetoclax kills cells and especially ones that, that have high BCL2 levels. And this is relevant because T1114 is really common in light chain amyloidosis. We don't know why this is in the sense that we see T1114 in multiple myeloma also, but far less commonly. So T1114 is present in about 20% of, of patients with multiple myeloma, but it's up to 50% of cases, of 50% of patients with AL. And biologically, again, we really don't understand why this is. But nonetheless, given the fact that this T1114 thing is present in 50% of cases of AL, there have been a couple of studies looking at venetoclax um, in light chain amyloidosis. And so these are very early. And so what you see here is the example, is one example that's been published fairly recently, where it was 10 patients with relapsed refractory amyloidosis, so patients who had been diagnosed, gotten chemotherapy, and then, and then come back and so they needed alternative therapy. Um, so 10 patients and they all got the venetoclax drug, mostly in different combinations. And so what you see on the right is what's called a swimmer's plot. And it's not hard to imagine when you look at the picture why we call that a swimmer's plot. It looks like you're staring at the top of the pool and you see the swimmers going to the right. And what you see here basically is that if you look at the, the, the bars that have the black arrows to the right, those are patients that are on venetoclax and still taking it. And so what you see is that there are some patients who it didn't really work for. But if you look at those patients, you know, the, the top ones are the one in the second row, relatively early on the bottom, you can see that's months. So that, that patient in row number two was about five months out. But then if you look at the two in the middle, those two orange ones, so those patients are 10 years, 10 months out, a year out. And then if you look at the green one at the bottom, that person's almost three years out. Um, and so these are patients who, again, again, had been through other forms of chemotherapy before. So the fact that this one is keeping the amyloidosis under control for a fairly long period of time, again, is a pill that you can take at home, don't have to come in for chemotherapy, um, very promising. And so this is, you know, we call this kind of early data, exploratory data. It basically, it, it shows that this is promising. It's not definitive. So bigger studies to really test this are ongoing. So stay tuned. And I should say we do use uh, venetoclax fairly frequently in the clinic in certain circumstances. So this is in some sense affecting clinical practice currently. Um, and so next up is amyloid degraders. I'm just looking at the clock. It looks like we're good. 
Um, so amyloid degraders, this is an extremely exciting field in amyloidosis currently. And this is the category that I mentioned earlier. If you remember that picture, that, that slide that had the plasma cells, the light chain protein on the left, and then the, the, uh, the, amyl the organ dysfunction on the bottom. These are the drugs, again, that go in, we think, stick to the amyloidosis that's in the different organs already. And basically, I think of it almost like a laser-guided smart bomb. So these drugs go in, they stick to the amyloidosis, they tell your immune system here, 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 and then your immune system goes in and breaks down the amyloidosis, kind of chews it up like a garbage disposal. Um, doxycycline, as said, the role for that is unclear. NeoD is one that we've had in studies for quite a while, and we'll see about that one. And then KL-101 is the one that's probably most promising at the moment, and fingers crossed for that one. And just as a reminder, so we talked about stem cell transplant, chemotherapy at the top, but right now we're talking about the drugs at the bottom. So drugs that, again, go into the organ, help to break down amyloidosis, and help those organs then to work better. So in terms of doxycycline, this one's controversial currently because basically it looked good for a long time. And then more recently, there's a study showing that maybe it doesn't help as much as we thought. So there hadn't really been prospective studies, meaning studies specifically designed um, and rigorously tested to, to really look at the role for doxycycline. What existed was basically different ways of looking back at patients who had been treated before in a variety of different ways. And these studies sometimes show that things can be helpful like doxycycline. So in this one, one of the first studies that came out was this top thing, which was a study out of the Mayo Clinic that basically where they looked at their experience with doxycycline and patients who had been through stem cell transplant. And what they observed was that if they looked at a whole bunch of patients who had been through stem cell transplant, not necessarily on a clinical study, these are routine patients that they're seeing in clinic, and they looked at patients who had the, their normal standard at the time, which was penicillin, and there was a group of patients who had gotten doxycycline because they were allergic to penicillin. And what they observed was that patients who got doxycycline, interestingly, had improvements in heart function and also lived longer. And there was another study that suggested the same thing. So put together, this was retrospective data suggesting that doxycycline could be helpful, especially in cardiac amyloidosis. Um, and basically, you can see in the middle there that the mechanism is really not all that well understood, but we think that the doxy may kind of interfere um, with fibril formation. So that process of the light chain sticking together and forming amyloidosis, and then it also may help to break down the amyloidosis once it's stuck there. Um, as mentioned, there was another study that this is one that came out of the UK. So the NAC is the National Amyloidosis Center, which is in London. So one of the world's largest amyloid centers. And what they found, well, they looked at a, a series of patients that they had. So it was 103 patients with cardiac amyloidosis. 30 of those patients got doxycycline. 72 patients did not. Otherwise, they were pretty similar. Um, and this is, again, fairly promising data and that this looks at the level of this protein called NT-proBNP. So nt -pro BNP is what we sometimes refer to as a cardiac biomarker. So we look at these things, and this is an example of a protein that's in the blood, and basically the heart secretes or produces nt -pro BNP, nt -pro BNP and puts it into the blood if there is damage to the heart. So basically, if the level is higher in amyloid, it means worse organ dysfunction or worse cardiac dysfunction. If it's lower, it suggests that the heart's getting better. And so as you can see, the, the column on the left or the graph on the, I guess the column on on the left is patients who got doxycycline. Column on the right is the control. And if you just look at that longest line in the middle, you see that it's higher in the control side versus the doxycycline side, which tells us that, um, that more patients on the doxycycline side had a cardiac response. And as they defined it, 60% of patients on doxycycline had a cardiac response versus 18% of patients who did not get doxycycline. So fairly promising. Um, and then they looked at this further. So in terms of survival, so you can see this is a, a graph for overall survival. So overall survival is, again, a clinical trials endpoint or something that we measure on clinical studies. And overall survival is just defined from time until study starts until death from any cause. It doesn't matter if it's from amyloidosis or something else, but death from any cause. And as you can basically see, when they broke this down by cardiac stage, which is what they're referring to in the fairly small print where you see stage, the top line stage two versus three A, middle one is doxycycline stage three B. And then you can see the bottom one, it's basically the two doxycycline lines are higher than the two control lines, which if you remember from the curve we looked at earlier, means that, that less or fewer bad things are happening. So in this case, it means that patients who got the doxycycline live longer than patients who did not get doxycycline. 
And so, you know, for a long time, I guess not a long time, but for probably five or maybe closer to 10 years now, we've been giving doxycycline to patients with cardiac amyloidosis. But then what's happened more recently is that the study came out, it was published, um, and it was a prospective study in China. So a prospective study is different from a retrospective study, where a retrospective study, again, is when we look back at our experience, it's not a formal study, but we basically look back at the chart, grab a bunch of patients and look at how people did versus a prospective study, which is a study specifically designed to, to test a theory. So in this case, this was a prospective study looking at the role for doxycycline. And so what you can see was that it was 140 patients had heart failure variable intensity, so some severe, some less severe. Everyone got the standard cyborg D chemotherapy, and then patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive doxycycline or no doxycycline. So basically, again, coin flip, and then they got doxycycline or they didn't. And what they saw on this was that no difference in liver, heart, or kidney response rate. So there was no difference in the heart, kidney, or liver getting better in patients if they got doxycycline or no doxycycline. And then as you see on the right, that's again, overall survival, where the most important part of that is that you can see the orange line and the blue line right in the middle. So not the dotted ones, but the solid ones are almost superimposable. And what that means is that there was no difference in overall survival, regardless of whether patients got doxycycline or control. So this study suggests that giving doxycycline and life chain amyloidosis does not actually make a difference. And so this is pretty controversial right now. I'd say that some, some of us are still giving doxy, others are not. Um, and importantly, there's a European study ongoing being led by some of the Ita Italian amyloid investigators, but right now we really don't have a concrete answer for what the role for doxycycline and, and cardiac amyloidosis should be, so stay tuned. Uh, but to move on to drugs that are, I think, a little bit more interesting, so NeoD, also known as bertamimab, um, is a drug that was designed specifically to um, basically break down amyloidosis. And so you can see on the left, this little schematic, the green, the green Y-shaped molecules are the bertamimab drug or are NeoD. And so it really does two different things. The first is at the top, the little yellow globs are basically clumps of light chain protein. And as you can see, the NeoD sticks to the light chain protein in the blood and that presumably prevents it from depositing in different tissues and forming amyloidosis. So they would call that neutralization or basically removal or clearance of that bad light chain protein in the blood so it's not available to form amyloidosis. And on the bottom, you see clearance. And the idea behind this is what I talked about earlier with sort of this laser guided smart bomb theory, where the NeoD is the laser guidance. So the drug goes in, it sticks to amyloidosis in the heart. And then the smart bomb is the macrophage or that, that cell that you see in the middle there that basically recognizes the laser guidance, goes in and starts chewing up the amyloidosis and breaking it down. So that's clearance of amyloidosis that's actually deposited in tissues already. And so in terms of kind of where NeoD is, is that there were very promising phase one and two studies, which led to cardiac improvement. So these were single arm studies where patients with cardiac involvement, um, some of whom were on chemotherapy, some of whom were not, received NeoD. And basically what we saw is that heart function seemed to get a whole lot better in patients after they got the drug. Then there were larger phase three studies, which are larger studies really designed to test whether something works, often with an endpoint of trying to get a drug F, uh, approved by, let's say, FDA for use um, and regular, regular um, standard of care. Um, and there were two big studies. One was known as VITAL, one was known as PRONTO. A lot of us amyloid investigators participated in these studies. Um, they were a little bit different in the sense that VITAL was a study for patients with newly diagnosed amyloidosis and they got NEOD, um, often with cyborg D chemotherapy. PRONTO was a slightly different study of patients who had had amyloidosis for a while. They'd finished up with chemotherapy. They still had heart dysfunction and those patients received NEOD versus placebo. They had similar endpoints, which were basically looking at different things like hospitalization from heart failure. Um, and both studies were stopped in mid-2018 because surprisingly they did an analysis on the data and, it's, and both studies showed that NEOD didn't seem to be doing anything to improve the endpoints. Um, and so I showed this, you know, I think the video tells a thousand, I guess, pictures to pictures. What am I trying to say? A picture is a, have a thousand words. Picture represents a thousand words. I don't know. We can figure that. We can sort that out during the Q&A. But in any case, videos are great. And so I think this is a really good one where basically you can see two, these are two cell cultures. And I just love this video. Even though I'm not sure what the drug does, I still love this video. And what you see is, again, two cultures. One of them involves the NeoD drug that's on the right, and one of them does not, and that's on the left. And basically what's happened in this experiment is that they've taken Petri dishes, 
They have then cells in the petri dishes. And with the petri dishes, they've coated the petri dish with amyloid. Um, and then they put these cells on and they put in what's called a radio tracer. And what that can do is that it can light up if something happens. And so what happens here is that if the cells chew up amyloidosis, then it basically turns red. So they, the cells light up. And so what you can see on the left is that that's a control. So those are Petri dish with amyloid, cells put on the Petri dish, no NeoD present. And you can see maybe a little bit of red, but really not a whole lot. Versus on the right, where 2A4 is the old name for NeoD. And what you see is that now that's a Petri dish with NeoD on it and the cells. And what you see, what you can see is that these cells are really gobbling up that, that, that amyloid protein and they're all turning red because they've ingested the amyloid and it's lighting up that radio tracer. So really kind of cool to look at, fun to watch, and it actually shows you how this drug works, we think, to label the amyloid and cause those, those cells to eat up the amyloid protein. And so you can imagine that if this is going on in the heart and those cells are chewing up amyloid, that could be a good thing to help to clear it out. Um, but when we looked at the vital study, so again, looking at this in actual patients, it did not suggest that there was a benefit. And this just shows some of the data. I'm not gonna get into it in exhaustive detail, uh, but basically what it shows is that there was no, no clear benefit to using this drug. And so you can see on the right, so they call this a modified intention to treat analysis. And basically the, the probably key thing to look at this is the P value. So you see in the cells all the way on the right under where it says MITT analyses, you see the lots of numbers. And then at the bottom of each of those cells, you see in the top one P equals 0 0.21. Then you see the lower one P, or the middle one P equals 0 0.51 and then P equals 0 0.05. For those to be significant, meaning for us to look at this and say it's real, those numbers typically need to be below 0 0.05. So what this tells you is that the, that the addition of NeoD did not seem to make a difference for the endpoints for the study. Um, but nonetheless, after further analysis, what happened is that um, there was a, more data came out on the study and they did further analysis on patients with stage four amyloidosis. Um, and stage four or Mayo stage four amyloidosis is patients with the most severe cardiac involvement. And what it suggested, what there actually was, a, is that there actually was a benefit to NeoD specifically in those patients. Um, and so as you can see, that HR refers to hazard ratio, but there's that kind of magic P value where you see it says P equals 0 0.025 over nine months. So that basically, long story short, is that it suggests that the drug could actually be helpful in patients with more severe amyloidosis. And so now there's another study ongoing looking specifically at that group, and it's a study called Affirm AL. So that study is ongoing, fingers crossed, hopefully it'll work, and then we'll have a drug for treating um, cardiac amyloidosis. And then to move on to the last one and then kind of wrap this up. So this is another drug called, initially called 11-1-F4, uh, more recently referred to as KL-101. And so this is another drug that's basically designed to stick to amyloidosis and help our immune system to clear it. Unfortunately, I don't have a great video of this one, um, so we'll have to sort of imagine it. But another drug designed to do things similar to the NeoD drug, although it's structured a little bit differently. And so this is, again, early phase clinical study looking at patients with confirmed AL amyloidosis. They'd received prior therapy. They're not currently getting chemotherapy. And basically, they have heart involvement. And so what we see here is basically, again, another response, a response graph where essentially on this graph, you can see lower is better. So a little bit complicated, but what this was looking at was levels of that NTB pro BNP protein that we talked about earlier. So lower is better. And so what you can see is that patients that had the dark blue bars are patients that had a significant drop of their NT pro BNP protein of 50% or more. So again, small numbers of patients, but very promising and suggested that the, that the KL-101 drug was helping to break down that amyloid protein in the heart, heart squeezes better, and that causes that NT pro BNP level to drop. So again, early data, but look pretty promising. And then similarly, they looked at kidney response. And what you can see here is not quite as many dark blue bars, but a good number is so about half of patients on, on this part of the study also had an improvement in the amount of protein that was leaking out through urine. Um, and that's a marker of kidney response and amyloidosis. So reduction in that protein is good. So about half of patients had more than a 50%, actually 30% reduction in, um, in their amyloid or in the, uh, the amount of protein that was leaking through the urine. So early studies, small numbers of patients, but very promising. And so what's going on now is this study, two different studies, KL-302 or KL-301 and KL-302. And both these studies are testing KL-101 in patients with newly diagnosed amyloidosis, where there's, again, a randomization to who gets KL-101 and who does not. 
Um, so again, everybody gets chemotherapy and typically now it's actually daratumumab cyborg D, which most of us in the US argue is standard of care for this patient population. Um, and there's a two to one randomization, meaning that there's, you know, we're basically picking numbers out of a hat. And as we pick out numbers, two patients will get KL-101 and one patient will not get KL-101. Primary endpoint for this study is overall survival. So basically the question is, does adding KL-101 to, to chemotherapy for newly diagnosed amyloidosis prolong survival? Um, and then it looks at important secondary endpoints such as cardiac improvement and quality of life. It's a very promising study and uh, stay tuned. Hopefully that one will be successful also. And again, we'll have that drug um, eventually FDA approved for amyloidosis if the study is successful. Um, and then the last thing, this will just take a minute, but talk to Isabel and she mentioned that it'd be interesting for the group to hear about the clinic that we have at UNC. Um, so those of you who have had this for a while and even those who are newly diagnosed probably recognize pretty well that it's a multi-system illness in the sense that it doesn't, it's not just about chemotherapy, rather the heart can be involved, the nerve can be involved, the, uh, the kidneys can be involved, the GI tract can be involved. And so a lot of times you have to see multiple doctors. And so what often ends up happening, even at UNC for a long time, where we've had this great amyloidosis team, so hematology, GI, cardiology, neurology, nephrology, all the different specialties that have, that have expertise in amyloidosis, so that it's been sort of a multidisciplinary virtual clinic, by which I mean that someone comes to see me in clinic and I say, okay, your kidneys are involved, your heart's involved, I need for you to see this person, they can get you in next week and it's in this different clinic and then the cardiologist can see you in two weeks and they're in this different space. So kind of traipsing all over the place to see all these different doctors. Um, and you all know that a lot of times you're not feeling great and so traipsing all over the place to different clinics, sometimes when you're coming from far away is really not all that fun. Um, and so one of my partners, Dr. Sam Rubenstein, has put together really kind of fulfilled a, a longstanding dream of mine, which is to do this in person um, at the same time. Um, so Mayo Clinic does this to some degree, Boston University does this to some degree, but not many other clinics do. And so now I'm really proud of the work that Sam has done in our group um, to say that we now have this multidisciplinary clinic in which patients come to see us and we're all, all the different specialties are in the same space meaning us in hematology, neurology, cardiology, and nephrology, we all see patients in the same clinic pretty much at the same time so that you're there for about a half day, you get evaluated, and then we come up with a comprehensive plan that we then share with your local doctor, or if you're close, then we treat you. Um, so we have that, which has really been great, and our patients, I think, are loving it. Um, other things we're working on, so a lot of therapy research, we've been involved in some of the studies that you see here, we're ongoing involvement with the KL-101 studies, um, so that's, of course, great. Uh, we're doing some new drug development in the lab. So this is nowhere near getting to patients, but we're working on um, different drugs for suppressing light chains, because if we can do that, then we can hopefully fix amyloidosis. Uh, a lot of non-therapeutic research. And then a big emphasis of ours also is on training the next generation and that, you know, we need more amyloid docs. And so we at UNC are really trying to bring up the next generation of people who are going to help us and hopefully take over from us after we retire someday, although I probably still have a lot of time left. Um, and so I'll wrap it up there. I think that's last slide. Oh, no, it's actually, so this one also. So just want to highlight again the fact that um, lots of extremely promising things happening in amyloidosis these days. And this just gives you a sense for a lot of the drugs that are coming. So these are not all necessarily just for AL. Some of these are for TTR. But basically, it just, um, just lays out all the new drugs that are coming in different phases. And it just shows how exciting this is. And even that red bar where Diratumumab has made it across the finish line and made it to commercial, which means that it's now FDA approved and available. So extremely exciting. And I think we're at the beginning of sort of a golden age of amyloidosis where new medicines are coming out. We're getting better, the treat, better at treating this and hopefully someday soon we'll have a cure for this. And I think that's it. So happy to do a Q&A. Excellent. Thank you. That was a really excellent talk and really highlights the importance and complexity of clinical trials and how, how valuable that data is. We have some great questions. So I'm going to just hop in and we'll get to as many as we can. There are a couple of questions that are around stem cell transplant. And one is, why is it only recommended for some patients? So stem cell transplant, uh, so the things to realize about that are that for those on the call who don't know and haven't had it, I tend to think of it as, um, I mean, it's one of the most aggressive things that we can do in medicine. So the idea behind stem cell transplant is that it's really just a way of giving a pretty massive dose of chemotherapy. And what that does is it goes in and kills off as many of those bad plasma cells as we can. 
Um, and then the transplant part is because that dose of chemotherapy also wipes out the bone marrow. So we, before the transplant, we have to collect these cells called stem cells that can rebuild the bone marrow so that we collect the stem cells, we do the chemotherapy, chemotherapy goes in, kills off amyloid cells, also kills off the bone marrow, and then we give stem cells back and they rebuild the bone marrow factory. Um, but it's, again, one of the most aggressive and toxic things that we do in medicine. It's quite rough in terms of side effects. Patients often have to spend a number of weeks in the hospital. It has a real mortality rate associated with it, meaning the percentage of people that don't survive it. Um, and, and the other thing to keep in mind is that it's not a cure for amyloidosis in most cases. That's a little bit controversial. And um, there are a lot of patients that have had transplants and even over the course of decades have not relapsed, but technically we don't necessarily think of it as a cure for amyloidosis. I hope I'm wrong, of course, but typically we don't think of it as a cure. Um, but just because it's not a cure and because it's so toxic, and especially these days when we have so many other good options, including geratumumab, um, we're typically very selective about patients who we send to transplant where we feel like the benefit really does outweigh the risk of doing it. So it's purely like everything else in medicine, it's a risk benefit calculation. And for some patients, it, the benefit outweighs the potential risk and for others, it's just too risky um, or the benefit's not likely to be great enough to warrant it. That's a great question though. A great question. Another question that followed on and was both about stem cell transplant and other treatments is how do you assess a complete response? So there are objective criteria for this, um, by which I mean that expert organizations for different, different disorders in medicine get together and essentially write the rules for how to diagnose the disorders, how to assess response after treatment. And so amyloid is no exception to that. So there have been response criteria put together by the International Society for Amyloidosis, which is a group that a lot of us are part of who are involved in amyloidosis. Um, and basically the, the sort of rules have been written for how to, how to assess responses in amyloidosis. And according to that kind of rule book, a complete response is defined as complete disappearance of the amyloidosis protein in the blood. So that means light chains have come down to most, to most often completely normal levels. If you had an M spike, the M spike is gone. If we do a urine study, all the bad proteins are gone from the urine. And then to officially call a complete response, we're also supposed to do a bone marrow biopsy and see less than 5% plasma cells in the bone marrow. So it's just according to the official rules, you know, we kind of do that test and if patients meet it, then we call it a complete response. Excellent. Um, we've had a few questions about DARA tumor and how long should one be on DARA? Is it being studied as a single agent? Should it be used after stem cell transplant? Yeah, so that's a, again, we're still learning about more the role of DARA. I'd say that most of us, you know, try not to leave patients on therapy indefinitely because unlike in myeloma, where some form of indefinite therapy has clearly been shown to be beneficial and by indefinite, I mean, you take a medication until the myeloma starts growing again. That sort of approach has never been shown to be beneficial in amyloidosis. Um, and so in terms of how to use diratumumab, the data that we have um, that have looked at this issue in any sense whatsoever really come from Andromeda. And Andro and Andromeda was given for two years. So I'd say a lot of us give it for some length of time. It may be two years. It may be less than two years. But I'd say most of us probably stop after that. Um, but then separately, if we talk about the relapse and refractory setting, meaning amyloidosis that somebody was diagnosed with, chemotherapy, amyloidosis got into remission and now it's come back. There has never been a, 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 any sort of comparative study for daratumumab in that situation. Um, and so basically it's, you know, we know that the drug works and we know that being on it is helpful for suppressing amyloid proteins, but no one really knows the right answer for how long we need to do it for. So I'd say that's really a discussion between your physician and you as the patient, by which I mean that when I discuss this with my patients, we discussed the fact that typically patients are doing fine. They're coming in once a month, which isn't too onerous. You know, it's much better than once a week or whatever. Uh, most often feel fine, most often responding well, meaning that the amyloid proteins are nice and low and hopefully they're feeling good. And we just discussed the fact that it's possible that keeping the daratumumab going for longer could help the organs to get a little bit better, could help to keep things under control for longer, could help patients to live longer. But we don't know that because the other possibility is that we could also stop the drug and the amyloidosis may come back a little bit earlier. So it could even be years later, could come back a little bit earlier and we could restart daratumumab at that time. And if there's no harm done, meaning you just restart it and the light chains go right back down, then you know no harm done and somebody's had a nice treatment break.
So we just have, so I think it's, you know, it's really a discussion that you should have with your physician to look at those two sides of it and decide, you know, is this something that I want to keep on coming in for once a month or do I want to break? Uh, but there's no clear right answer to that medically currently. I think it's coming, but we just don't know right now. Mm -hmm. So I have just another couple of quick questions. I know we're at, at time, but I think it'd be interesting to just touch on. One was why is green tea, and this is the kind of the next frontier, why is green tea controversial? And the last question, I'll just give it to you is, um, can you see a time or is it even considered possible now that you could have an antifibril without needing the chemo agents? Um, so, so green tea or this chemical called EGCG, which is probably the chemical in green tea that's effective, um, is one that we really don't understand. And this just comes from the fact that lots of sort of nutraceuticals have not been all that well studied in really rigorous scientific studies that we need to do to show benefit. But there's some thought that that EGCG chemical in green tea may help to break down amyloid fibrils. And it has something to do with interfering with the formation of amyloid fibrils, basically getting between the different fibrils and causing them to, to not stick together. Um, so there have been a couple small studies that show that it's promising um, and so it basically comes from that. The other thing to keep in mind, though, is that there's also some data showing that green tea can interfere possibly with Velcade, so bortezomib chemotherapy. So if you want to try that, and especially if you're on the bortezomib Velcade drug, definitely let your physician know so that they can look through everything and make sure that it's safe. Because what you don't want to do is get on, get on some sort of agent like that, that, you know, we're not sure what the benefit is, but it could mess with your chemotherapy. Uh, and the other question about, about whether or not we'll ever have therapies that are just directed at the fibrils. I think, yes, it's entirely possible because in a lot of patients, the cells in the bone marrow really, really aren't doing a whole lot. There's not all that much protein in the blood. It's more just that the organs are affected and it's hard to fix that. But if we had, you know, if their cells aren't doing much and the protein's not doing much, and then it makes sense that we don't necessarily need to mess with them and we can just go ahead and treat the organs with an antifibril drug. I mean, I think for the, the way to prevent further injury most often is to try to suppress that bad protein. So there probably will always be a role for suppressing plasma cells and suppressing that light chain protein as much as possible, especially with relatively easy drugs like daratumumab. But, but yes, it is possible to envision that particularly for some patients, purely antifibril therapy could be, um, could be appropriate. Excellent. Thank you so much. We are uh little over time and I don't want to take up more of your time than we committed to. Um, I would like to really, it was an, a fabulous talk and I think there is um, real hope and so exciting to hear the results from the DARA study and see the impact that it's having. I know just there were a few questions that a number of, a couple of people posted about whether these um, applied for wild type and ATTR different hereditary as well. Now this talk was specifically around AL amyloidosis. We have other resources on the ARC website that um, provide other talks as well as, as information that will give you um, more to those disease types. Last question before we sign off is um, a couple of questions about how could people contact your center? Um, so probably email. I'll put my email up. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you so much again for giving this talk. It's really so encouraging to hear and um, really so useful. So thank you. Thank you. I mean, huge thanks to Isabel and to ARC. I mean, your organization really is doing such great work, including webinars like this. So thanks for involving me. I'm happy to help. Excellent. Thank you. Bye.